Hi everyone, I'm going to talk to you today about cardiac sonography or echocardiography. Can be used, the terms are kind of used interchangeably. Um, a lot of times I'm going to refer to it just strictly as echo as well, and that's a term they just kind of use um, to shorten it a little bit, make it easier to pronounce. So this image here is a standard view of what it would look like in the sonography room with the uh, technologist scanning the patient and doing an echocardiogram. So the machine is the same machine that they would use for general sonography. They use different modes on it. So you see all the buttons here that we learned when we were talking about general sonography. And she's got the transducer over the area of the heart right there. She's doing a short axis, parasternal short axis view. And I can tell just by the way she's holding the transducer and the position of it what view she would be trying to um, take there. So echocardiography is also known as cardiac sonography, like I said, or echo for short. Um, it is a sonogram of the heart. It uses high frequency sound waves just like general sonography. That's their energy source. So it is technically ultrasound. Um, an echocardiogram or an echo is an ultrasound based test that shows the heart's mechanical functions and it also shows the heart's muscular wall and valves. Those can be evaluated as well. So those are just some of the things that we're trying to look at when we go in to have a cardiac sonogram. How cardiac sonography works? Well, like I said before, echo uses ultrasound technology. It uses high frequency sound waves. So it is an ultrasound. Um, it's the same as general sonography where they use the transducer on the skin. They have to have a conductive gel, just like regular sonography. And then um, the transducer is just placed over the chest in the area of interest for the heart. So same thing as before, sound waves from the transducer are going to move through the body. And then they're going to bounce off that heart like an echo. And then the transducer is going to pick up those reflected sound waves, which are then converted into images of the heart. So it's the same basic concept that we've already learned, except for cardiac sonography is specifically looking at the heart. The pertinence to the medical community is echo can be used to evaluate and diagnose and guide treatment for problems of the heart. It's non-invasive, which is great. Um, an echocardiogram can play an important role in helping the doctor determine how your heart is actually working, if something's going on, what it is, and, and how they can help treat it. So cardiac sonography, sonographers can work together with different modalities to combine care and tests to help diagnose someone's issues. So a lot of times they'll work together with pulmonary or stress labs to combine the stress tests and echoes. Um, they can work with the cardiac cath lab, which is interventional care, and they can also work with nuclear medicine. So there's a lot of tests that go hand in hand to help properly diagnose a patient's heart conditions or diseases to try to give the best treatment possible for that patient. So cardiac sonographers, they really need to have a good understanding of the heart's anatomy and how it functions. Um, the structure and the function of the heart is really important. If we're going to be scanning it and making sure that we get adequate images, we need to know that anatomy. We need to know how it functions. The heart itself is about the size of your fist. Um, the heart is actually considered a pump. It pumps blood throughout our bodies, and it works very hard at its job. So it's a very hard-working muscle that pumps blood throughout over 60,000 miles of blood vessels at an average of 80 times per minute. Think about that for a second. That is very impressive. 60,000 miles of blood vessels at an average of over 80 times per minute. That heart is working hard. So the heart itself is divided into right and left sides, and it has two upper chambers that are called the atria, and two lower chambers that are called the ventricles. An easy way for me to remember where they are in the heart is to think um, A for atrium comes before V for ventricles. So the A is always over the V. So the atrium are on top of the ventricles. That's just an easy way for me to remember it. So each of those four chambers is kind of like a tiny room with valves that act as like a one-way door to help control that blood flow. 
So this is a, an illustration of the heart and how the blood flows through it. So what happens is um, blood is going to flow into the right atrium of the heart through the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava right here. So then um, they're going to go into the right atrium. The blood fills the right atrium. Then it's going to go through that tricuspid valve. So this is the valve right here. So these open and close to allow blood to flow through one way only. Kind of reminds me of like, you know, the old saloon doors that you walk through and they open up. Or flippers for <laughs> um, an old pinball game. But um, it only allows blood flow to one way. So it goes through the right atrium, goes through the tricuspid valve, and into the right ventricle. Then the blood's going to flow uh, through the pulmonary valve, which is right here. This is the pulmonary valve, and um, to the pulmonary arteries. Then it's going to travel to the lungs through the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery to get oxygen. After it gets oxygen from the lungs, then it's going to come back to the heart through the pulmonary veins over here on the left side of the heart. Remember um, that... Arteries take blood away from the heart, so A for arteries is away, and veins bring blood back to the heart. So those left pulmonary veins are going to bring blood into the left atrium, and then that passes through this valve right here, which is the mitral valve, and then the blood goes into the left ventricle. Then what happens is it goes out the aortic valve right here, and travels up the aorta, carrying oxygen, oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. So this is kind of a diagram of how the heart works and how the blood flows. As a cardiac sonographer, it's really important to know all the different components of the heart and how the blood is going to flow. Um, here's just a different version of the same thing, but this one has the valves labeled. So you've got the pulmonary valve, um, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve here. I got a little video I'm going to show you that um, will show you how the heart works as well. The heart is a muscle about the size of your fist. It lies behind and to the left of your breastbone or sternum. The purpose of the heart is to pump blood through blood vessels, arteries, and veins to all parts of your body. The inside of the heart is divided into four chambers. The top two chambers are called the atria and are collection chambers for blood. The bottom two chambers are called the ventricles and receive the blood from the atria and pump it to the lungs and the body. The chambers are separated by valves which control the direction of blood flow. There are four valves, tricuspid, pulmonic, mitral, and aortic. Circulation begins at the right side of the heart, where blood from the body comes to the right atrium. This blood passes to the right ventricle, where it is pumped to the lungs to receive oxygen. Once it receives oxygen, it flows to the left atrium, and then to the left ventricle, where it is pumped to the aorta and the rest of the body. On the right side of the heart, the tricuspid valve separates the right atrium and the right ventricle allowing blood to enter the ventricle, but not flow backwards to the atrium. Blood flows through the pulmonic valve to go to the lungs. On the left side of the heart, the mitral valve separates the left atrium and the left ventricle. Blood flows from the left ventricle to the aorta through the aortic valve and to the rest of the body. Arteries carry blood with oxygen and other nutrients throughout the body. Veins take blood back to the heart, which pumps it to the lungs to be oxygenated. The heart arteries, coronary arteries, provide oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle. The right coronary artery supplies blood to the bottom and the back of the heart. The left coronary artery splits into two vessels. One branch supplies blood to the front of the heart. The other branch delivers blood to the left side of the heart. An electric system transmits signals throughout the heart to control its pumping. The electrical signal starts in the sinoatrial, or SA node, which is located in the upper portion of the right atrium and is known as the natural pacemaker of the heart. 
the electrical signal passes down to the lower chambers of the heart via the atrioventricular, or AV node, which controls the signal so the atria contract before the ventricles. In the ventricles, pathways carry the signal throughout the muscle so that they contract at the same time to pump blood to the lungs and through the body. So the video gives you just a little bit of a better idea of how it works without me just explaining it. One of the other things that sometimes helps me remember the difference between the atrium and the ventricle is the ventricles kind of look like a V. If you look at them here, this looks like a V. I mean, this one's not very V-like, but a little more than the um, aorta, or atrium, I'm sorry. But the atrium almost looks like a lowercase a, too. So that just those are just two ways that help me remember the A over the V because A comes before V or the ventricles look a little bit more V-shaped. So um, what does a cardiac ultrasound or an echo show? What we're actually looking at is um, the size of the heart, their chambers, and the walls. Normally the walls of the left ventricle are thicker than the right because the left ventricle is pumping blood to the rest of the body. So it has a higher pressure system. So those walls tend to be a little bit thicker. Um, we're also looking at the size and movement of each ventricle. Those are examined during an echo. This is important because when part of the heart muscle is damaged from like a heart attack, for example, it will cause the healthy areas to work even harder to accommodate for that damaged tissue. So the extra work can actually increase the heart's muscle size. You know, most of the time when we exercise, um, you know, when our muscles get bigger, they become stronger. But that's not really the case in the heart. An enlarged heart may lose some of its strength. So if a heart gets bigger, it's not a good thing. It's usually um, a bad thing. So during the echo exam, they also check the coordination and timing of the function within the heart. So with each contraction, blood is squeezed out of the chambers, and with each relaxation, the blood fills or the heart fills up with blood. So as this occurs, the valves open and close to regulate that direction of the blood flow. So each valve is designed to allow the forward flow of blood, and then it prevents it from flowing back. So when I think about the heart and when I talk about how when it contracts, um, with each contraction, blood is squeezed out of the heart, and with each relaxation, the heart fills back up, I kind of think of a sponge. You know, when you take a sponge that's full of water, when you squeeze or contract your hand, all that water squeezed out, right? And then when you let your hand go and run it underwater, it fills back up. So that's kind of how it helps me remember a little bit um, of the relaxation and the contraction of the heart and the blood. So some different reasons for the exams. If a patient goes to their doctor with specific complaints, the doctor may order an echocardiogram. And some of these reasons might be shortness of breath, fatigue, chest pain, heart murmurs, palpitations, or swelling in the arms or legs. Those can be good reasons for ordering a cardiac um, sonogram, but there could be other reasons as well if the doctor wants that done. Things that a doctor is looking for or may find on an echo is heart failure, um, coronary artery disease, that's when the arteries have plaque buildup and then they kind of restrict the blood flow. They may find hardening of the arteries, which is called um, arterial sclerosis. That's where the actual walls of the arteries um, harden or become thicker. They're looking for um, congenital health heart defects, sorry, congenital heart defects, such as like a hole in the heart. They are looking at for high blood pressure. So it shows peripheral va uh, vascular disease on an echo which is common in people who have high blood pressure. And then they're also looking for uh, valvular heart disease, which is characterized by damage to or a defect in one of the four heart valves. So in some of the valvular disease, the valve flaps may become too narrow or too wide, not closing or opening properly. Uh, this actually results in blood flowing in the wrong direction, which is regurgitation, or difficulty pumping the blood forward. 
So an echo is really important. It can help the doctor visualize specific actions within the heart, such as the valves that don't open or close properly. There's a lot for them to be able to diagnose or to see going on with the heart just from this study. Um, as far as risks for cardiac sonography, there really are no risks. We use sound waves. There's no radiation exposure. So in all of the years that ultrasound is being used on patients, they've never found a side effect or a risk for it. The most frequent exams that are done in echo, um, there's three different frequent exams. There's a basic echo, there's an echo with stress, and then there's a TEE, which is short for transesophageal echo. So the first one is the basic echo. It's usually the fastest, the easiest, and most common. So the echo mostly uses 2D imaging to allow the structures to be viewed moving in real time in a cross section of the heart. So echoes are performed to detect abnormalities, um, like abnormal anatomy or abnormal movement of the structures. The most common views of a basic echo are the parasternal long axis, the parasternal short axis, the apical view, and the suprasternal view. And I'll go through all those and I have some pictures of them in a little bit. But the echo is performed to visualize the valves and how they're functioning. It's good for checking for stenosis, which is narrowing of those aortic valves. And this is done by measuring the aortic valve area and checking peak velocity and pressure. So they're checking for regurgitation. I used that word earlier. That's when the valve doesn't close tightly, causing the blood to flow backwards or leak backwards. Remember with those valves, their whole job is to keep the blood flowing in one direction. We don't want it going back or regurgitating back. They're also going to check for hemodynamic info. It is used to check your blood circulation and see how well your heart is actually working. It's measuring that blood flowing through the heart. The echocardiogram is also checking the pathophysiology. Pathophysiology is, seeks to explain the function or functional changes that are occurring when a person has a disease. So they're checking the heart wall thickness, they're looking for heart enlargement or tumors even. So one of the things that they do during a basic echo as well that not very many people are aware of is they actually um, do an ECG. That An ECG is part of an echocardiogram procedure. An ECG is also known as an electrocardiogram and it's a test that measures the electrical activity of the heartbeat to see if it's working normal. Um, so it checks the heart's rhythm and electrical activity. And I'm sure you've heard it, a lot of people um, refer to it as an EKG, but it's an ECG in this slide. So if you're asked if an ECG is part of an echocardiogram, your answer would be yes, it is. Another common exam is an echo with stress or if the patient isn't capable of walking on a treadmill or a bike, they can do a pharmacological echo in which they use drugs to stress the heart instead of the exercise. So an echo with stress, um, they perform a basic echo as soon when the patient gets there while they're resting because they want to see how their heart acts while it's resting. They're going to track the structure, function, how everything's working at that resting rate. Then what they do is they hook the patient up to a heart monitor. So I don't know if you've ever had one before, but I have. It's kind of um, crazy. They actually use sandpaper to roughen up the skin in the area where they want to put those electrodes so that it'll stick better. So they'll roughen up the skin with like a little sandpaper, and then they use rubbing alcohol to clean that area off, which let me tell you, stings a little bit. And then they're going to put those electrodes on the skin so that they can monitor the heart while they're, the patient is stressing or using the treadmill. So they'll start the patient out on the treadmill or bike. Usually a treadmill is more common. Um, and then they'll slowly increase the speed until the heart patient's heart rate reaches about 85% of the target. So sometimes that's walking, sometimes that's running. I had to run on mine so to get my heart rate up to that um, rate. So it's just going to depend on each individual person. But immediately after that target heart rate is reached, they do another echo exam while the patient's heart rate is still up. 
So they're wanting to see the difference between how the heart acts at a resting rate and how it acts when it's stressed. So it's most often used to detect a decrease in the blood flow to the heart from the narrowing of the coronary arteries. So if the patient isn't able to perform that stress echo where they walk on a treadmill or the mic in the bike due to physical conditions or restrictions from activity or things like that, they can do um, the pharmacological echo instead. So what it is is they're using drugs to increase the heart rate medicine to get the heart rate up. So they would do the same thing. They would um, have the patient come in, they do the resting echo first, and then they would hook them up to the heart monitors just the same. And then they, what they would do is give them IV dopamine, which is going to increase the heart rate. And then they'll do that second echo while the drug's kind of being administered and raises the heart rate up. So they can still see the heart at rest and during a stressful time when the, the heart rate's up. This is an image of a cardiac stress test. So this patient is actually on a treadmill right now. You can see here they have all the telemetry, the heart monitor hooked up to him, and they're watching it on the screen here to wait for his heart rate to get up to that target rate that they're looking for. And then they can lay him right down on that stretcher behind him and do the echo. There are times where patients have a cardiac stress test without the stress echo. So they might have a, a standard echo test done and then a cardiac stress test done separately. It just depends on what the doctor is looking for and the reason why they would do that. The third most frequent exam is the TEE or the transesophageal echo. This is a special type of echocardiogram. It's a little bit different than your standard one. So a TEE is usually done if the doctor wants to get a closer look at the heart. For the TEE, a transducer with a flexible tube on it is actually inserted into the mouth and down the esophagus to obtain images. Because your heart is right by the esophagus, the TEE provides clearer, more detailed images of the left chamber of the heart compared to the standard echo. So the TEE is used a lot to check for blood clots or guide treatment um, for atrial fibrillation, which is a type of arrhythmia. It's also used to check for infections in the heart. It can check for structural abnormalities. They can use it to guide the positioning of catheters. And they can also use it to assess the chambers, valves, blood vessels, and check for proper blood flow. So if a patient is having a TE, it's going to be a little bit more involved than a standard echo because it is invasive. So the patient will have to remove any jewelry. They also have them take out any removable dental work, and the patient will put a gown on. The patient will get an IV for um, sedatives or medication. The patients, we use conscious sedation, so the patient will still be awake, but they're not going to remember any of it. We call that an amnesia drug. So the patient can be awake, they can talk to you, they know exactly what's going on, but then after the procedure, they won't really remember what happened. So the patient lays on the table on their left side, and then what they do is they spray like a local anesthetic into the mouth, into the back of the throat to kind of numb it. And it'll help kind of make that passing of the probe a little bit more comfortable. So after that numbs up, they're going to put that probe down the throat. Like I said, that patient's awake, so they may actually ask the patient to swallow, which can help aid moving that um, transducer down the esophagus. Once the probe is in place, then the doctor's just going to take images, and once they get all the images that they need, then they'll remove the probe. So there are <clears throat> extra staff doing this TEE procedure. It does require extra personnel. So you may be asked, does a TEE procedure require extra personnel? And your answer would be yes. The sonographer themselves, they don't really do much during that procedure because the physician is running the TEE probe, but the sonographer may operate the recording images or they may change some of the controls on the computer and things like that and assist the doctor during the procedure. This is a picture of kind of what the TEE does. So you can see here they put the probe in the throat and then they come all the way down here. There's the transducer here on the end 
And then that, see how close it is to the heart, how they can get a better view here. So it just depends on what they're, you know, trying to look at. So this is just a short little video that talks about the TEE procedure. Um, and the doctor pronounces it, he t pronounces it a little funny. I used to work with a radiologist who would pronounce esophagus, esophagus. Esophageal echocardiography, TEE. Transophageal echocardiography is a diagnostic test using an ultrasound device that is passed into the esophagus, the foot tube that connects the mouth to the stomach of the patient, to create a nuclear image of the heart muscle and other parts of the heart. Since the esophagus is right next to the heart, transesophageal echocardiography provides a very clear picture of the heart. It can provide information to the size of the heart, its pumping strength and the location and extent of any damage to its tissues. Procedure a tube with a device called a transducer is passed down into the patient's throat and into the esophagus. The transducer directs ultrasound waves into the heart and the reflected sound waves are picked up by the transducer and converted into image. A transesophageal echocardiography examination generally lasts 30 to 60 minutes. The patient is given a mild sedative and the back of the throat is sprayed with a local anesthetic. It is viewed through an endoscope that is carefully positioned into the esophagus. When the transducer directs ultrasound waves into the heart, some of the waves are reflected or echoed back to the transducer. Different parts of the body and blood vessels reflect ultrasound waves differently. These sound waves are converted into images, which is displayed on a monitor or recorded on a paper or tape. So the prep for each of these um, echocardiograms is going to vary. So it's just going to depend on what exam is being done. For a basic echo, there's no prep that's required. The doctor may ask the patient not to take certain medications, like heart meds, that may affect how the heart is operating because they want to see how it operates under normal situations, not with medicine on board. The stress echo prep is going to be NPO for four hours prior. They also do not want the patient to drink any caffeine 24 hours prior to this te the test because caffeine can affect how the heart works. It can actually make it race, so they don't want that for that stress test. Um, they might also ask the patient to not take certain heart meds the day of. The other prep that they tell you ahead of time is to wear a two-piece outfit and comfortable shoes. I mean, it is kind of like you're exercising, and like that showed in that picture, that gentleman had his shirt off. When I had mine done, they worked around my clothes. Um, I was able to leave my bra on, I had a tank top on, and um, they let me leave my tank top on, and they put the electrodes, you know, around that area. So... Um, under my tank top and, and from the top down. So trying to wear something that you can, you know, maintain modesty for the patient is always good. The TEE echo is going to be NPO for six hours, and then they're going to need a driver as well because the patient is given sedation. Anytime a patient is given sedation, even if they wake up and they feel fine, they cannot drive. The hospital legally cannot let them drive at, um, for 24 hours after giving sedation. The length of the exam, again, varies depending on what type of exam it is. The basic echo is about 30 minutes to an hour. So anything within that time frame would be a, you know, a fine answer. So if you were asked how long a basic echocardiogram takes, anything between 30 minutes and an hour would be sufficient. So 40 minutes would be correct, 50 minutes would be correct, you get my drift. So if you're asked how long a basic echo is, anything between 30 minutes and one hour would be a correct answer. Um, an echo with stress is about an hour and a half to two hours long. So those are a little bit longer because you've got the echo ahead of time. You've got the patient on the treadmill and getting them all set up, getting their heart rate up to that target rate, and then scanning them again. So it's going to depend on you know how long it takes their heart rate to get up and how long the scans take before and after as well. The TEE takes about two hours, which is pre and post assessment. So getting the patient ready, starting the IV, getting them in the room, doing the procedure, and then getting them out and letting the sedative wear off. The scan time itself and how long that probe is down their throat and how long they're taking images is only about 10 to 15 minutes. 
the cost of the exam um, is middle of the road, so it costs anywhere between $300 and $1,800. Obviously, the basic echo is going to be on the cheaper end at about $300, and the TEE that's going to require extra personnel and a, and a procedure room is going to be a little bit higher at the $1,800 mark. The patient perspective is going to vary greatly. I mean, it's going to depend on what type of test we're doing, right? So the basic echo is usually fairly easy. It's non-invasive. Um, the stress is easy to, could be difficult for some patients. It's going to depend on their level of ability. I mean, some patients might not be able to get on a treadmill. I mean, we take some of those things, you know, for granted, but for some older patients, it's going to be hard for them to run. I have issues with one of my legs. Um, I've had leg pain for a couple of years, and it's hard for me to do any sort of exercising, walking, running, anything like that. So even when I had my stress test done, I was a little bit nervous about if I would be able to run on that treadmill. So I can imagine how difficult it would be for somebody with a mobility issue or things like that. So that can cause a level of anxiety. Um, it can be a modesty issue with women. I mean, when they're putting those electrodes on, um, the basic echo, I mean, you have to expose that breast area. I mean, you're scanning above, below, and beside the breast at all times. So it's right there. So that's always something to take into consideration is trying to protect that person's modesty. The TEE procedure, um, there could be a lot of anxiety. I mean, somebody tells me they want to stick a tube down my throat it's not gonna you know make me feel great and excited about it so it's a little bit more invasive um, there is sedation involved so that can be a little bit nerve-wracking so again the perspective is going to depend on the exam and the patient itself most patients when it comes to the possibility that something is going on with their heart most of them are going to be anxious about that so that's something that you need to take into consideration from the sonographer's view, sonographers must be reassuring. You know, like I just said, those patients are going to be anxious. They, you need to talk to them and be reassuring that they can do this, that, you know, especially when it comes to something like the stress or the TEE where they're going to be really nervous about it. Give information that you can share. Be informative. You know, you're not going to be able to tell them everything, but some information you can share. One of the things that was really helpful for me when I was doing that stress test is them talking to me and telling me how long it was going to be. All right, you're getting closer. Maybe, you know, another two minutes, another minute, another 30 seconds. You're almost there, 10 more seconds. You know, that kind of helped me get through it a little bit more when it became difficult for me to run and do the things that I needed to do. Um, always be professional. I mean, that should go without saying. Um, but I have to tell you, I've worked with a lot of technologists over the years that are not professional. So that's something that I don't feel like I should have to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. Make sure that you are always professional in front of patients. I mean, if you've ever been in a situation where a healthcare worker is unprofessional, it doesn't make you feel good about the situation at all. And we want to always make sure that our patients feel comfortable. And that goes right along with the being confident. You know, nothing is worse than feeling like the person who's doing your exam doesn't know what the heck they're doing. If you've ever had that done, you know that feeling. You know, you're thinking, well, geez, you know, this isn't going to be a good test. What if they miss something because they don't know what they're doing? So even as you go forward as a student and things like that, it's really important that you are confident. Even if you're not 100% confident on the inside, you need to show it on the outside. Don't make comments. I've had students over the years that are like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing, or I just totally screwed that up in front of a patient. Do not do that. They don't need to know that you're not 100% sure. You can get the help that you need. You can make sure that person has an adequate study while still being professional and showing confidence. There's ways to kind of work around that to not let the patient feel uncomfortable. It's always important as well to be aware of your facial expressions and your body language. I actually just had a conversation with my son about that. He doesn't realize sometimes the facial expressions he makes. I'm like, why are you looking at me like I'm completely stupid? He's like, I'm not. You know, so you need to be aware of those facial expressions. I always uh, share with my students when I was um, 15, 
I worked at my aunt's pizza restaurant and a patient came up and complained about something and and I did all the right things. I don't remember what it was at this point, whether it was I apologized, just, you know, told her I would make her a new order or refunded her money, whatever I did. I did all those right steps, but all of a sudden my aunt came up and was yelling at me and I'm like, what? I had rolled my eyes at that patient and, or not patient, duh, I've obviously worked in healthcare too long. I rolled my eyes at that customer and I didn't even know that I did it. I was a 15 year old girl. I mean, obviously, but I don't think I've even ever rolled my eyes since that situation because it bothered me that I wasn't even aware that I did it. So obviously I don't think you're going to roll your eyes at your patients, but I mean, sometimes patients say some things where you're thinking, really? But just be aware of your facial expressions. Most of the time, if you can just smile through something, it, it stops you from having <laughs> adverse expressions that you wouldn't want to. But also, you know, if you see something on the screen that's bad, you know, if there's something going on with this person and you see some sort of disease or abnormality that's bad, you can't be like, oh gosh, oh man, that's rough. Well, you know, then your patient's first reaction is going to be like, what's going on? And you can't tell them. So you need to kind of just have that straight face, no reaction, don't make different facial expressions. That's really important. So an echocardiogram is performed by a registered sonographer, but the images are interpreted by different people depending on where they are performed. So if it's performed at a hospital, they're usually interpreted by a radiologist. But if it's at a heart clinic, they might just be interpreted interpreted by the cardiologist or the you know the heart doctor. So it's going to depend on where the person is getting the images done. So if you're asked who, if you're asked an echocardiogram is interpreted by, the answer would be a cardiologist and a physician. It's just going to depend on where that is. So going on still with who performs the echocardiogram, registered diagnostic sonographers are registered through the ARDMS, so the ARDMS is the American Registry of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers, if you remember. That's here in America, in the United States. The CCI is the Cardiovascular Credentialing International. So if you're registered through the CCI, your registry is international. But most of the time, that's absolutely not necessary. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Sonographers in the United States are just registered through the ARDMS. So a sonographer who has gone through the, their clinicals and taken their didactic courses, they're going to take their board exam and they're going to be a registered technologist through the ARDMS and their initials are going to be RDCSAE. So like my a name, for example, would be Stacy Van Riper, RDCS for Registered Diagnostic Cardiac Sonography, and then AE, which stands for Adult Echocardiography. So if it was fetal, it would be FE, or pediatric, it would be PE. So if you're registered through the CCI, then your initials would be RCS for Registered Cardiac sonographer. So my initials would be Stacy Van Riper, RCS. So for our purposes for this program, we would be registered through the um, ARDMS. So if you're asked, an ARDMS registered cardiac sonographer will possess the following credentials. You would pick RDCSAE for registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer in adult echocardiogram. There are some ethical issues when it comes to cardiac sonography and that would just be unregistered people performing echocardiography. So um, the thing with that is, you know, especially if it's done at a clinic where there's not as much regulations like there is at a hospital, they could have unqualified people performing those exams. So a registered sonographer can be trained on the job and then sit for the cardiac sonography board exam. 
So it's just a little bit different. So if you go through the general sonography program, you can train in vascular or cardiac sonography sometimes on the job, depending on where you work. But if you go through the cardiac sonography program, you can't train on the job for general sonography. You would have to go back through the program for that. So it's a little bit different. So imaging planes in cardiac sonography, um, we use cross-sectional anatomy. So the heart is a th three-dimensional structure, right? But we're displaying it in, in a 2D image, unless we're using 3D or 4D ultrasound. But ECHO uses, like I said, that cross-sectional anatomy. We use cardiac axis planes. So we use the long axis plane, which runs from the apex of the heart through the base of the heart and the long axis of the aortic valve. So think of the heart as being long and wide, right? So the long axis view is from the top to the bottom of the heart. And then we do a four chamber axis view, which is perpendicular to the long axis view, so it's kind of the width of the heart, but it includes all four chambers of the heart. And then we do a short axis view, which is a perpendicular to the long axis and the four chamber axis view. So I've got some images here that I'll show you in just a second. So the next one here, this kind of shows you the images. So the heart is long wise this way, right? So here's the long axis view, which is going down the length of the heart. The short axis view is cutting into you know, the short side, so it's perpendicular to the long axis. And then the four chamber view is going up the heart this way. So these are some of the more common probe positions on the anatomy for the cardiac synod. So A here is used for the parasternal long axis and the parasternal short axis. So the, for the parasternal long axis, the indicator on the transducer is aimed towards the patient's right shoulder. So this transducer actually would be turned. You can kind of see the arrows here. To, do, to, get the, to obtain the parasternal long axis and short axis view, you don't actually pick the transducer up. You want to leave it right there because you've already found the anatomy. So you can actually just turn or rotate the transducer clockwise to get it into the views. So if the probe marker, remember how we talked about those markers on the transducers before? So there's either like a little notch you can feel or there's like a little sticker like a green dot. That tells the orientation of the transducer. So that portion on the transducer should be pointing at the patient's right shoulder. If it's in line like that, then the transducer is going to be going in the long axis of the heart. Then if you just rotate the transducer, I'm not picking it up, and then you turn that tip, so say if this part of the transducer is pointing at the right shoulder now, if we rotate it so that the mark on the transducer is pointing at the right hip, so imagine that rotating just a little bit, that would be counterclockwise on this one, then that would be the, how we obtain the short axis view. Some people will rotate it till it's at the left shoulder, too. It just depends on what each person does. It can be slightly different. The B probe position down here is the subxiphoid or the subcostal. It depends on people use different terms. You'll see it both. So that is where you find the xiphoid tip. And you're going to go right under the xiphoid tip, and you're going to angle up just a little bit superiorly to view the heart. C, the probe view C here is we're going to actually point that indicator um, again towards the right hip a little bit. The patient actually rolls up onto their left side for this position. The other ones can be done supine, but for C, the apical view, a lot of times they like to have the patient roll onto the left side. That actually brings the heart closer to the chest wall, and then it's easier to visualize. So for this one, they want to position it on this is a male person, you're going to put it right under the nipple. But on a female that has breast tissue, you're actually going to put it right under the fold of the breast. So you'd actually kind of lift up the breast and go right underneath that fold. 
So here's another um, view kind of of where the probe placement would be. So green here is going to be the parasternal and short axis. So you can see here if that transducer is pointing to that right shoulder, here's the long axis view right here. We're getting the long axis of the heart. And then if we just rotate it, here's the short axis view. So we're rotating that transducer. And this is what the um, parasternal, parasternal short axis view would be. So just by rotating that transducer, not picking it up, not moving it, we're getting a, com a completely different view of the heart. We're slicing it in from side to side instead of by length. The subxiphoid four chamber view is what this one's called. That's the view that we're going to get when we put the transducer down here and point it superiorly. And then the axial, or apical, sorry, the apical view when the patient's on the left side and we go right under that nipple line. So just by slightly moving that transducer around the patient, we're getting completely different views of the heart. So here on this one, we can see the left atrium, the mitral valve, left ventricle, and we can see a small portion of the right ventricle on the long axis view. On the short axis view, we can see the left ventricle and then these papillary muscles right here and the right ventricle. The four chamber view is called that because we can see all four chambers. So we can see the left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle here. Same is on the apical four chamber view, but it is getting a different perspective. This one just kind of shows the different um, ultrasounds that we would see here and what they look like. So here's that long axis view again. So you've got the right ventricle here. We've got the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the aortic valve right here. So that's what we would be able to visualize on that. The parasternal short axis, you're seeing the left ventricle with the papillary muscles in here, and then the right ventricle. And then these are the four chamber views. So they're just a little bit different. So this one you've got left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And this one's just a little bit more of a side view. So left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And on this one you can see the inferior vena cava as well. It's really hard to see in this small little image, but... So again, here's kind of some of the probe placements. I don't think these images come out very clear, and I'm really sorry about that. But right here on this one, so they've got the transducer here for the parasternal views for the long axis. The indicator on that transducer that's either you know raised that you can feel or a marker is pointing towards that patient's right shoulder. And then here, we've got the indicator mark on the actual image that's showing us the orientation of our probe. And then the short axis view, the indicator marker is pointing towards the patient's right hip. And we can see the short axis with the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And our probe indicator marker is marking the correct side of the patient. So we know this is the right side of the patient. And then here is the apical view. And you can see even on this one, the patient is actually rolled up to their left side. And again, they've got that transducer marker going towards that patient's right hip. So this is the apical four chamber view. So it's going to show all four chambers of the heart with the left ventricle having the thickest walls. So that is a question that you might be asked, which ventricle has the thickest walls, and it would be the left ventricle. And on the next view, you can really see it well. But on this one, you can see right atrium, the tricuspid valve here, the right ventricle, left atrium, you can see the mitral valve here that goes into the left ventricle. Oh, it's a couple slides away. I'm sorry. I thought that the next one would show you the walls. So this is the left ventricle, and you can kind of see a difference here, how much thicker the walls are of the left ventricle than the right. You've got the mitral valve here that opens in those flaps open and close. The apical four chamber view again. 
I like the difference with the diagrams here and then the ultrasound on the same side because it can give you a better view and what you're actually looking at. You know, it's not as detailed on the ultrasound, so it's hard to pick up some of the anatomy. This is the peristernal short axis view that shows the aortic valve. So this is a little bit different. So I always call that kind of like the Mercedes-Benz sign. You can see, you know, the three lines are kind of like an upside down peace sign. That's how you can tell that that's the aortic valve. But you can see the right atrium here, the tricuspid valve is right here, and the left atrium down here. But, you know, the aortic valve is like the upside down peace sign or Mercedes-Benz sign. This is the parasornal short axis view that shows the papillary muscles. This one sometimes they call the avocado view. So it kind of looks like an avocado. So you're visualizing the left ventricle and it really shows the difference in the thickness. So here, I mean, you can see how thick the walls of the left ventricle are versus the right. Here, this is the right ventricle. Look at how thin that right wall is compared to the left. But this view is actually good to visualize these papillary muscles right here on both sides and on a regular x-ray they would be moving so here you can see them right here and right here this is a 3d mitral valve and I actually have an image where it moves um, if you look under JetNet there's an actual um, link for 3d images I'll pull those up now so you can see it kind of moving so this is a 3D ultrasound of the mitral valve. Sometimes this is called the fish mouth view as well because it looks like a fish mouth opening and closing. But you can see there how the mitral valve opens and closes to allow that blood to only flow in one direction. So if there isn't a kind of tight seal or tight close when it closes, the blood can regurgitate or, or go backwards the wrong way. This one here is showing you the two chambers, the two left chambers, the left atria, left ventricle, um, and separated by the mitral valve. But I'll show you this as well on the 3D view so you can kind of see it in live action moving. Alright, so here's the 3D version of that. So like I said, here's the two left chambers. So you've got the left atrium here with the mitral valve that's opening and closing and the left ventricle down here. So as you can see that mitral valve, it's kind of like a flap that flaps open and flaps closed with each beat of the heart as the blood flows from the left atrium into the left ventricle. I think these 3D images are pretty cool. So this image here is the sub xiphoid view. So what it's showing here is you can see right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. It's hard to see up here because it just looks black, but down here what this is is it's pericardial effusion. So what that is is it's excess fluid around the heart in the sac that surrounds the heart. So you, there is actually effusion around here as well. So sometimes this can make the heart work really poorly if it's got a lot of excess fluid around it's putting pressure on the heart and it doesn't perform as well as it normally would. This next image here is what's called mitral valve calcification. So here's the mitral valve here kind of open right now. And on the bottom of that mitral valve, you can see on this side, there's just a little bit of calcification, just mild. But on this patient over here, all of this white is severe calcifications. This one here shows the echo Doppler. So Remember when we talked about before on color Doppler that the red is the blood that's flowing towards the heart and the blue is the blood that's flowing away from the heart. So you can kind of see the flow, not flowing away from the heart, I'm sorry, away from the transducer. So here's the transducer from the top of the screen, right? And it's giving you this window, this acoustic window here. So the red is the blood flowing towards the transducer and the blue is blood flowing away from the transducer. So before I talked about like some of the regurgitation and how the blood flows. So on this one you can see 
the difference in some of that mitral valve regurgitation. So here's the mitral valve, and as that flap opens and closes on a live x-ray, you'd be able to see it. But this is a little bit of mild regurgitation where the blood is flowing the wrong way. Instead of going through the mitral valve, it's coming back up into the atrium. So this is mild, and this would be moderate, so there's quite a bit of blood flow here. So it's by this yellow and blue colors, you can see that it's flowing the wrong way. And then this patient has severe mitral valve regurgitation. So these are some of the things that we're trying to look at when we do cardiac sonography. So cardiac sonography is very important. I mean, the heart is a very important muscle, and if something's going on with it, we need to have good visualization. I, I think I talked to you guys before about what the difference um, having a good echocardiogram can mean when I talked about even a um, situation that happened with our family member who had a echocardiogram and it was inconclusive because the person that was doing it didn't get adequate images. So they actually had to go in and have a cath procedure done because the technologist didn't get good quality images so the doctor wasn't able to get a good diagnosis. So it's very important to make sure that you're getting good quality images and you know know what you're doing in this situation. So if you have more questions about cardiac sonography, here's a couple of the professional organizations, the American Society of Echocardiography and the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers. You can get on there and get some more information.